transformation in the post-pandemic world. Joining us from Taipei today for today's discussion is Che Han Yu. He's CEO of APIA. And here with me in Singapore, Russell Cohen. He's Group MD Operations at Grab and Ahmed Mazari, he's president of Microsoft Asia. Gentlemen, welcome. Thank you for being here with me today. Johan, let's begin with you. Many brands have suffered due to this pandemic. And in order to mitigate the impact from the pandemic, they've, they've had to rethink efforts in order to, to really to survive, uh, perhaps even to become more relevant. What's driving the digital transformation that we need to see going forward across sectors? I think transformation has always been necessary and pand pandemic means that organizations have to come to clearly understand that future proving of your business is vital as econ economic and social uh, situation can change rapidly. Uh, especially we are in a dr dramatic change, not only in a pandemic, but also geopolitical situations. I think it is very important time to grab uh, uh, market shares and to also focus uh, the resource in the most op optimal way and also to forecast the future demands because we also see the demand for uh, digital needs and also online uh, transaction has surged uh, for the last couple of months and we also see more innovation coming up we also see some company actually take the crisis into opportunity and turn into the weakness into strengths especially transform the way uh, they do business for example some retail store they start to minimize the cost expenditures, but at the same time, transform the way how they deliver, how they serve customer in digital way. In this way, they can actually do business uh, much more effectively, even uh, post uh, uh, COVID situations. And business should, be, should also remember that transformation does not have a final destination. It's always constant and require flexibility and adaptivity uh, over time. And digital transformation is no longer an option. Pretty much for all business, we need to do uh, to serve our customer in all channels. Picking up on what uh, Chohan just mentioned there, Russell, I want to bring you into the conversation on this in terms of the fact that transformation doesn't have a final destination. If companies haven't done so already, why do they need to reimagine what transformation means for them? So, uh, you know, I think uh, there's a really interesting statistic. Prior to the COVID pandemic, only about one third of small businesses uh, in Southeast Asia had a digital presence. And in particular, that was very acute, not only in the small business, but what we call the micro SME sector. And so what the COVID pandemic has really done is from a transformational perspective is really sort of... Um, caused an urgent need for those businesses to get online, develop a sales channel, develop a storefront, work out how to, how to communicate with consumers, develop a brand, generate demand. And so from the Grab platform perspective, since the start of the pandemic, we've onboarded about 80,000 of these micro uh, SMEs onto our platform, which has been really meaningful for us and obviously for these merchants. Uh, we've had a whole range of initiatives to really help these first time digital sellers, uh, you know, transform their businesses, whether it's buying advertising online for the first time, selling their goods online. We've also worked with really big brands and manufacturers. We had a partnership who had trouble as supply chains were disrupted, reaching, you know, mum and pop stores across Southeast Asia. And so we were able to do that with our fleet. So the urgency is there, the need is there. Ahmed, Microsoft is one of those large companies that's leading the way when it comes to transformation. Not all of the impacts that we've seen have been sort of equal amongst organizations, big and small. What can we learn from Microsoft in terms of what transformation is going to mean? You know, I describe the current situation as being in the same storm in different boats. But what it has done is it's really converged physicality and technology in one domain, right? And I take the example of, of uh, Taiwan, since uh, we have a guest from Taiwan. You know, we actually turned 200,000 teachers and 25 million students to move online because education came to a halt, mm -hmm. right? Um, another example is, is Zulik Pharma, uh, where they were reaching out to 350,000 medical institutions to provide medical supplies. And they had to rapidly move into an ability, like you said, you know, enterprises, even micro enterprises, pharmacists who were not online and we enabled their, their move. So the change is quite profound, but change is elastic, right? We're in a state where change will become more continuous uh, in the future. 
we as a platform company have a very big role in creating societal impact and inclusion. And on that point, Russell, you mentioned the initiatives that Grab has had as far as small and medium-sized enterprises are concerned. And we know that they make up the bulk of, of, most, of, of most economies, and particularly those in this part of the world. Uh, Grab through its Grab for Good Goals, that was announced last year. You've had success then, but you know, the, the sort of urgency to step up on, on achieving some of those goals has become even clearer now. So can you take us through what's at stake for the pace of business transformation at this juncture for companies like that. The COVID pandemic has sort of really sort of sharpened our focus on that because the, the constituents that we were focused on with Grab for Good are uniquely affected by this pandemic. So if you think firstly about small businesses, which we're discussing today, and really helping them digitize and get online, like, like we mentioned. Secondly, you know, in our Grab for Good initiative, it's very much about financial inclusion. Financial inclusion has a, has a number of pieces, not only access to credit for, for businesses, but also facilitating cashless payments and providing you know, a whole range of sort of financial services for the unbanked and the underbanked. If you think about cashless payments, for example, which has a very clear health imperative in this COVID crisis, you know, we've had more than 50% growth in cashless payments just simply in our food business as people have opted for contactless payments. And then the third constituent, and our Grab for Good initiative was were uh, people with disabilities. And so we have a lot of you know, deaf and disabled driver partners and merchant partners on the Grab app who, who, earn an, who earn an income on the platform, which is very meaningful for us in terms of having a social impact. So that digitization process, if we didn't think it was important before, it's become paramount now. Jahan, let's come back to you on this point, because what I'd like to know from you, from APIA's perspective, with your clients, how do you ensure that the right client gets the right solution? Our companies will might be to be a solution to our customers. Our customers, then they need to use those tools and also infrastructures. So it's super important to ensure the robustness and resilience of the, the platform. We also need to set up a very uh, rightful mindset in terms of our operations, uh, because we will, we will see a business and then uh, changes. We also need to quickly adapt that. We first set a priority that the health of our employees, number one. Second, as uh, the, the continuity of our operation is number two. And third is we need to speed up the innovation in order to help our customer to cope with these periods. Then we actually prioritize our key industries and also forecast for next six to 12 months, what kind of innovation is needed and then prioritize based on the, the necessity of the most important innovation we need to develop during this period of time. So driving innovation, that's something that not everybody has, you know, the sort of same view about because there are many types of innovation. It's not always just technical. But I, mean, I know that Microsoft believes uh, in this importance of a culture of innovation, and you have said that it is achieved through this combination of technology, but also employee empowerment. Those two ingredients together must work hand in hand. So how do companies ensure that they've got that right mix? It's a very hard balance, uh, Don. And uh, if I may add, there is technology, people, process, and data. Those are the four attributes for innovation as we define. And what the pandemic has done is that we're actually seeing what we call two years of digital transformation happen in two months. If you think about the realities of a micro enterprise, a florist whose inability to sell fresh flowers does not have an online portal and there are no consumers for the product. They pivot to dry flowers on an online portal. That's innovation, but that's also survival. But then you start to go into the point around data. Data becomes very critical. Data estate is becoming one of the most critical differentiators because when you cannot touch a consumer, what is your surrogate to determining what the consumer needs? How then do companies ensure that what they're doing now, the changes that they're making you know, towards innovation and so on, that they're not reactionary, that they're going to have this lasting impact? A lot of the changes that we've observed in the marketplace in Southeast Asia, we actually believe are, are, are permanent. I mean, we think these are fundamental shifts in the way people consume, the way they look for products, the way they pay. Customers are far more attuned to safety and hygiene considerations. We don't think there's any going back from that, even after the, you know, the pandemic uh, you know, comes to some sort of a, a resolution. So the way in which you know, consumers 
uh, feel about deliveries or getting in a, a vehicle in a ride hailing capacity. You know, we introduced a, a whole set of standards called Grab Protect, which helped us communicate to customers that they could be assured when they get in a car, they're a, a hand sanitizer, the driver's wearing a mask. We explained to them how to do a contactless delivery. So we think those are permanent sort of behavioral changes that we've had to build into our product and innovate very quickly. Secondly, people are, are consuming in a different way. The preference to buy online, uh, the, the sort of massive shift towards e-commerce and mobile commerce, we think a lot of that is, is, is structural and will remain afterwards. We don't think, you know, th there's a return to, to sort of the classic sort of retail model. And so that has a lot of implications. And lastly, sort of, I, I talked earlier about cashless payments, but that not only, not only has a consumer impact, it radically changes the way businesses operate as well. And the ecosystem that businesses need to support a cashless future around the way in which they reconcile their books, the way in which they offer credits, adjust pricing, work with suppliers. We think that, again, is transformational and we don't believe the businesses, you know, will go back. And so these are, these are profound changes triggered by the pandemic that we think will, will have lasting impact in Southeast Asia. And a lot of the success that you would have had as well, you know, to that point would have been the trust that your customers have had in you. That trust that you had built even before the pandemic. So, I mean, how much does that sort of come into play when it comes to sort of the success of, of, of how a company is going to transform? Trust has many dimensions, right? Um, and in an industry that we haven't spoken about, which is healthcare. So there's a huge innovation that, that we enabled with NHS um, in the UK. A COVID patient was being touched by 29 medical practitioners when they entered a hospital. You couldn't take the risk of exposing 29 people, practitioners who were needed the most. So we completely redid their engagement model using HoloLenses and digital technology to move to two people touching from 29. And we actually saved 700 PPE equipment right there. Now that was an innovation that is long lasting and it's replicable across the board. I mean, no one knows just how long this pandemic is going to last. And for so many organizations, they want to be able to thrive. Do they take the small wins, take the small opportunities? Is that the way to go forward? It's perhaps the only way to go forward when times are uncertain and change is elastic, as I said. You know, at, at this stage, we're thinking about grab the wins and celebrate the wins. I think the most important aspect that we have to think about, Dawn, is how do we continue to keep people engaged? The downside of the pandemic, amongst many other things, is that employee engagement is becoming so swim lane focused that we see the impact on social capital. The other issue that we see as a consequence of video meetings all the time is that the cognitive load on the brain is higher on vi video meetings. So we're driving innovation back to the point that you made around commute times. So we're introducing commute times in a Teams platform. We're introducing together mode where you can actually look at people as if they were sitting across from you. And this is just the beginning of many aspects of innovation. Now, do we call it innovation? For sure we do, but these are little things that we are driving in our product suits, suite and solutions that help make workplace more productive and effective. Mm. And another one of those drivers is going to be this idea of upskilling, reskilling and so on. These are terms that are being thrown about a lot, but for the, for the worker, for the employee, what does it really mean and how do leaders decide going forward in this transformed business environment who to reskill and why they're reskilling them. Russell? Yeah, so, I mean, through Grab's sort of history of eight and a half years, it's been a mobile-first company. In fact, our entire solution, all our products are built on the cloud. You know, we've built since day one, uh, you know, AI and machine learning algorithms into all our products. So it's, it's less a focus in terms of our own skilling, but much more around our, our partners, our driver partners or our restaurant partners. And the message we've been giving to our teams is that, that right now in this COVID pandemic, the people who need the tools, the people who need the new platforms, the people who need the innovation are really our customer groups. And so that's helped us basically build out a whole bunch of new, what we call merchant solutions during the pandemic. And we've released a whole lot of seller tools, self-serve advertising tools, onboarding tools, improving the selling experience for all our merchant partners. So the upskilling messages is, is, is alive and well at Grab. If I could 
build on that because we have a partnership. Mm. We joined hands with Grab to upskill 100 drivers who were uh, impacted through and uh, of the thousands that got impacted. And they're now doing tech jobs. In Asia, we have upskilled a million and a half people. And we have a global plan of getting to 25 million because we believe that the biggest divide today that separates the world is the point you started with, which is around skill. The haves and the have-nots around digital capabilities. Digital tools are central to the transformation that we hope to see. And one of those, of course, is artificial intelligence. Now, Jahan, AI is something you know a lot about. What role is it going to play in this transformed business landscape? When we look at AI transformations, we are always looking at uh, two dimensions. One is the readiness of the, in, uh, the data in a certain industry. And second is also mindset and also mental readiness to embrace AI augmented or AI automated tools. People are moving more and more uh, digital data uh, online and they are mostly in a more structured formats that enable AI to easier to parse and easier to understand and also make accurate prediction based on that. And secondly, uh, as uh, the people are now also using those such tools is no longer an option. It's actually a very important part uh, for the business to thrive. All of these changes are going to require some really steady leadership going forward and also a buy-in from your employers as well, that they can, they trust you. What about this idea of resilience then? You know, the pandemic kind of gave us a shock and in a sense destroyed the idea that we were all that resilient. So how do you get that buy-in? We see as two different attributes um, at the minimum. One is operating resilience and the other is technological resilience. You create employee engagement around by having continuous a dialogue and by inclusion. One of the aspects that we, we think that, that most companies have to pay very particular attention towards is how are you including people? And the only way to today include is not the physical touch or the physical meeting, but it's about communication. But some studies show that trust is at an all-time low as well. So speaking about consumer and customer engagement, how do you sort of re-engage with you know, clients who perhaps have lost some of that trust? I mean, f f from Grab's perspective, it, it's really around, you know, our product experience, right? We invest a lot of time in sort of, you know, kind of trying to innovate and experiment to, to, to build products that we believe, you know, meet a customer need. Um, for customers who have disengaged or the pandemic has, has sort of interrupted, let's say, their relationship with, you know, uh, how they buy, how they shop. For us, it's about re-engagement. And so we've got a whole set of sort of, you know, kind of adaptations to our marketing calendar, adaptations to the way we communicate, adaptations to the way we message that are far more sensitive to what people may be going through at this time of distress. Now they'll be rather focused on food affordability, whereas before they may have been focused on special occasions. They're focused on hygiene and safety, whereas before they may have been focused on speed. And so for us, it's really about adapting the products and services to meet these new sort of COVID realities. I mean, I think it's interesting that you pointed out the relationship that Microsoft has with Grab. Are partnerships what this transformed business landscape are going to be about? Partnerships will be not only critical to survival, but it'll be crucial for further innovation. We see convergence happening in a, in a huge way in certain domains. But what will be fundamental? It'll be fundamentally built on trust. We at Microsoft believe that trust and the equivalence of trust is, will be as important as, um, as people's rights. And therefore, who secures your data? Where does the data reside? How is the data uh, being used is going to be fundamental in the future. This is a shared challenge. When the dust settles, Russell, are you confident that we are going to see the value of collaboration? Is that what's going to come out of all of this? Yeah, I mean, I think some of the lessons are firstly around diversification, right? So diversification of supply chains, diversification of where our employees were, you know, are based, diversification of our sales channels, you know, things that before may have been optional or nice to have are very much now um, a need and, and will be a permanent part of business going forward. Secondly, a lesson of inclusivity has made the, the, the need for financial inclusion even more urgent and the need for access to credit, need for small business loans to support solvency and support cashless ecosystem for us is even more critical. Thank you very much, Thank you, Russell. Don.
Ahmed and Shahan, thank you very much for sharing your time with me today. It's been a pleasure speaking to all of you. Thank you. Talent in the post-pandemic world. My guests today are joining us from Sydney, Mr. Simon Tate. He's president of the Asia Pacific at Adobe. And to my right, Grace Yip, head of HR Southeast Asia at Accenture. And last but not least, Dr. Michael Fung. He is deputy chief executive at Skills Future Singapore. Simon, I'd like to begin our conversation by going over to you. Every employer, every job seeker has in one way or another been impacted by this viral outbreak in one way or another. We pivoted very, very quickly. And the question now is, are we able to make those changes stick? The ones that were meant to ameliorate the situation? How did your workforce at Adobe actually pivot to these new changes? I think like most companies, we're dealing with our first pandemic, there's no precedent for how we change, how we pivot uh, our entire workforce to working remotely. And so there were certainly some very tough lessons that we learned along the way, and we've not yet learned them all. Pressures and expectations didn't change. We still have a business to run. We still have customers to serve. And yet, almost overnight, we expected our employees to continue to do everything that they were normally doing, but in a completely virtual world. And for most of us, that meant working from home. And I think many leaders, certainly those that I talked to in my peer group, underestimated how big that change management exercise would actually be. And think about how this plays out in a practical sense. We've got Zoom calls going on with kids running around in the background, uh, pets in many cases running around the house. We are constrained with real estate. We're competing for bandwidth with teenagers playing the Xbox and streaming Netflix doing homeschooling. I mean, when you reflect on what we've all had to deal with over the six months, it's been absolutely crazy. So it's been really difficult, uh, but there's a couple of decisions we made. We provided incentives for people to have the right technology put into their home studies. We provided incentives around uh, school care and daycare. We provided flexibility into our normal processes around maternity leave and paternity leave and carers leave. We introduced programs which allowed people to take a day off every month because we realized that people were working so much harder, longer hours, which is no surprise because all of that commuting time where we switched off on public transport, for example, on the way into or out of the office, that's now productive time. You know, the journey from my house to my workplace now takes 10 seconds, not an hour. And so I'm productive for at least two to three hours more in any given day than uh, what I'm used to. Well, let's go to Grace on that point about effective leadership, as it were, before the pandemic. They already had a lot on their plate, mm. more so now. Tell me, Grace, you know, what are the major priorities that have arisen for, for good leaders to bring their workforces through this pandemic? I think that there are a few key elements that are important for leaders to think about. The first is really about creating that connection and collaboration, right? Because when we've all moved to a very virtual world, the natural forming of bonds uh, and relationships as you bring in new people in the firm, it becomes very foreign for them to actually appreciate what the culture and what the company actually stands for. And we've done a lot of that by re-engineering our whole new joiner orientation program over three weeks to really create that cultural sense. That's going to be really important because people are still human and they need that connection. I think the other thing is about capabilities, right, and the capacity to learn and reskill. I think it's gotten even harder. And we've known that for a very long time, reskilling and staying relevant has been a very major part of a leader's job in making sure that people stay relevant, but it gets harder now. 
And therefore, how do we make things more bite-sized? How do you create that space um, and the ability for people to focus on the right things and to learn and develop themselves? And then finally, I think there is a space around care and compassion. I think if there is a time for leaders to really think about how they care about their employees, it is now. Um, you know, rethinking the way we provide benefits. And I think Simon gave some really good examples. The role of mental wellness, which has been a very big focus uh, for, for us at Accenture and how we've elevated mental wellness uh, as part of our benefits and how we build human resiliency. And then looking out for vulnerable parts of our workforce. There are many people who've lost their jobs, who've been retrenched, who might be wondering how they can sort of get out of this quagmire. At the same time, there are people who have talent and who, who have been seen as valuable members within their organizations who might even be wondering, am I still relevant? And we've seen that across sectors as well. So, Michael, let's bring you in on the conversation here with regards th the point that Grace was making about capabilities. Mm -hmm the idea of upskilling and, and you know, upgrading yourself. That, we've been talking about that for a long time. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, it's in a brand new package. What do we do with this? COVID, has, uh, it's really pushed us over the uh, tipping point, if you would. Pushed many businesses and individuals over the tipping point. It's forced many businesses to have to transform because if they don't transform, they're not going to survive. Uh, but companies don't transform themselves. They need a skilled workforce to be able to transform themselves. So I think organizations, businesses need to work with their staff to provide that kind of pathway uh, towards uh, upskilling. Well, at SkillsFuture, we've rolled out a range of programs to help companies, enable them to build capabilities to transform, and for individuals to pick up new skills. Uh, so for example, we have uh, recently launched uh, the SG United Jobs and Skills Package where individuals can go through a six to 12 month program, pick up new skills, including in areas of digi digital skills, uh, and be able to take on new jobs, whether within the companies or uh, outside of the companies. And if they're retrenched, they can go on this program and try to find a job after that. So I think the key message is really that uh, businesses need to embrace the fact that disruption is here. They have to actively think about how they transform their businesses to survive and grow, uh, and they have to bring the workforce along. Individuals, I think we have to embrace the notion that our current job, even though it may have been very secure in the past, may not be secure in the future. So the only way is to keep upskilling ourselves to respond to the changes. And, and on I, that, uh, and I think on, a lot of that is also about having that growth mindset to yes. learning new mm. skills Indeed. and being willing to and open to change. Right? Um, for many of us, the career we started out our. Uh, in the workforce with isn't always going to be the career that we end up, right? And that opportunity to um, pivot from the skills that we have to adjacent skills. I think that's where uh, if employers can actually help people understand how they can pick up new and relevant skills and provide those clear pathways or learning nuggets that allow people to spend that 15 minutes learning rather than looking for the learning. So in creating those clear pathways, though, Simon, we were talking about productivity before. You were saying you've been working at home, probably working longer hours than you ever have. You know, has that dispelled the whole notion of, of you can't be productive at, if you're at home? I think we've proved that we can absolutely be productive from home. And in many cases, I would argue, we've demonstrated we can be more productive from home. The question is, though, at what cost? Are we creating a different social divide to the one that we are now trying so desperately to escape? It's fascinating how everything that we knew about doing business, communicating, interacting, collaborating, has now fundamentally changed. But to Michael's earlier point on skills, if you think back to our parents' generation or our grandparents' generation, they got through their entire career with one or two skill sets. And certainly in my grandparents' generation, Loyalty was a big thing and they would work for the same company for 20, 30 years before they retired. 
my kids will have three or four different careers with three or four completely different skill sets required. And so this notion of being a digital native and having digital native DNA injected in every employee not only serves to protect them in the role that they currently have, but I think will help future-proof the kinds of skills that we'll need of the labour force over the next five or ten years. So the elements of this are fascinating. On one hand, you've got this sudden change in how we work, collaborate, interact as human beings, going from a physical world to a virtual world. And then in another sense, you've got this pressure from boards, business owners, and indeed from employees themselves to now dramatically reskill with digital skills, skills that we've not really needed, at least not in earnest, uh, up until the point that um, the pandemic happened. Grace, there are opportunities that have arisen from all the disruption that we've seen in this pandemic. You know, demands from clients, from consumers, they have shifted in exponentially in many ways. What do leaders have to do now in order to win this war for talent when they think of hiring people? I think there is a fundamental shift in the way we think about talent and therefore what talent is appropriate for a company now. Um, yes, you will always be needing to hire people with the right technical and functional skills. You can't run away from that. But beyond that, we need to think broader around the right um, skills uh, and sometimes the proclivities even as we hire people straight out of sc school. So I often think about how we find people with the right potential over pedigree. Uh, so we stopped looking at a lot of, uh, you know, certificates, you know, grades mm -hmm. as a basis of inferring whether people have the right attitudes, the right potential. Uh, and we look for broader things like the ability to learn quickly and adapt, um, the way people are processing uh, challenging problems and able to apply their problem solving skills. Because these are the things that you see and you need in the workforce, right? So, you know, we, we've leveraged a lot more neuroscience games, actually, to make it fun in the hiring process, but to also understand what sort of talent uh, we would actually need for the long haul. Because skills you can teach, uh, experiences people gain along the way, but trying to find people with the right perspectives, the right attitudes, um, the ability to adapt, those are the things that you can't quite always teach people how to do that. Mm. So I think rethinking what and how you can leverage the new ways of recruiting and the talent is important. Um, the other thing is, how do you bring across what your company is about and the culture uh, and what it feels like, especially when in today's world, the recruiters no longer go out and meet people, right? But with technology and the right platforms, you can actually bring your entire leadership team uh, to candidates, right? You can leverage a lot more um, platform approaches to make these connections real, even in a virtual world. So there are many ways to kind of focus on that experience a bit a little bit differently from what we might have been used to. So to that point, Grace, I'd like to get Simon's take on this. Simon, what decisions has Adobe had to do in terms of looking for the right talent in this new workforce? It's interesting this concept of the war on talent has shifted now because the profile of employees we need are so very different to what they were pre-pandemic. We need people who come from diverse backgrounds, who are creatives, who are willing to drive an innovation agenda, who understand that we are now living in an experience economy where digital first is the mainstay of any business. Finding that kind of talent is not easy. And that's what 
I think will be the struggle for many companies over the next few years. And it's not just a generational issue. It goes back to my original point of people of uh, all backgrounds, uh, all generations, having that digital native DNA. Fast forward three, four years, I think we're all going to be struggling. Michael, pick up now on, on Simon's point there about you know, this idea of relevance as well. Yeah. How do you answer that question? Hmm. Yeah, so if we, if we take a look at the kinds of skills that are really in demand uh, in the current paradigm we're in and, and going forward, uh, there's a whole set of skills around adapting to change, being able to think cre uh, critically, creatively, and so on. We call them the critical core skills. And that's something that we are looking to embed within all the training uh, programs that we support. Uh, there are also a set of digital skills that have become very important, given the amount of di digitalization that businesses are going through. Things around data analytics, uh, automation, robotics, cybersecurity, cloud computing, and so on. Mm -hmm. Having a combination of those skills are going to be very important. Uh, and in my organization, at SkillsFuture itself, we've actually sent all our staff for AI training, for data training. So over the last year or so, every single staff has gone for a two-day workshop to get a sense of what AI is, what machine learning is, uh, how do they set up data dashboards, and so on. I think that's one step along the way to get staff to be comfortable to start on that journey uh, to embrace digital as part of uh, our, our core business. For the wider workforce and industry out there, with a range of courses that we support under the uh, Skills Future for Digital Workplace, under the Skills Future series, and also with IMDA, with ESG, there are specific programs uh, to look at in, uh, boosting the digital skills of our workforce as a whole. Mm -hmm. And maybe just taking up on that example, um, at Accenture, we've started this thing called Technology Quotient, which is raising everyone's quotient on understanding different types of technology, cloud, you know, robotics, and so on and so forth. And we've made it a leadership priority across the entire firm. So it's not just okay to have IQ and EQ, now you need to have TQ. I'm glad you yeah. brought up the issue of the TQ and the IQ, but it does start with the EQ, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. And so when you do hire the talent that you need and you skill them to the level that you need them to be skilled at, how should we take care of them as well? I mean, this brings me back to what you were saying about mental wellness yes, for absolutely. workers, because it, it cannot be you know, overstated that we need to take care of each other as well. And I think the conversation of mental wellness has truly come to the forefront, and I think everyone is feeling it, right? I, I don't think there is any person who hasn't fundamentally had to rethink the way that they work and live as we've gone through a pandemic. And everyone's experience has been different but difficult. Um, and I feel that uh, this is the point where as leaders uh, and as good companies, we do need to put uh, a stake in the sand and say mental wellness is something that we must care about, not just the physical health of our people. And it will fundamentally speak a lot about employers and their ability to, first of all, recognize that stress um, and stressful situations are something that has kind of gone through the roof for everyone um, and that we do need to take extra care and concern at this point in time. So how do you create a community of people who will support mental wellness, which we have. We've created a program called Mental Health Allies, right, so that people feel comfortable reaching out to their peers just to kind of express how they feel and they then sign posts for other uh, people who are stressed how to get help. We created this thing called the Virtual Village where we offer tutoring services and anyone could help tutor kids. Uh, we created a Lean In Circle that supports a lot of uh, women and they find support from other people who are in the same position. And those things do help. If I can pick, on, uh, pick off on Grace's point, I think it's important and it's critical leadership. New leadership skills is going to be critical and important. How do we manage and lead organizations going forward in the new paradigm where many of our staff are working from home, telecommuting, needing the flexibility and so on. So I think leaders need to develop those skills on having uh, a way of managing and engaging staff that will support uh, you know, sustainable work and, and uh, environment and arrangements yeah. for them. Uh, leaders have to be able to 
be agile in their decision making, afford flexibility, probably managed by outcomes rather than by process, uh, and be able to deal with a much more uncertain uh, future. I think we have time for one quick final question. And, and I want to put it to Simon, because we've also seen with this remote working the concern that your job could be done by somebody very, very far away and with a, a different set of, of considerations. So, so there, there are demographic I, uh, sort of questions that, that come into play in terms of hiring now. So w how do we deal with that one? How does a, a business deal with that one? I think what started off as the world's largest social experiment is going to end up being a um, social revolution. And there are two sides to this. There is the accessibility that leaders now have to a completely different talent pool, previously inaccessible because they lived outside of major cities. That doesn't matter anymore. You can work from anywhere and we've proven that we can be productive. So we're able, on one hand, to tap into this enormous uh, talent pool of previously uh, inaccessible people. But on the other hand, you have people who feel marginalised, who feel like they are not adequately skilled and resourced with the kinds of digital skills that we've discussed will be paramount uh, to most companies' future. And that's the big paradigm. Now, the interesting thing for me in this discussion is what COVID has done is accelerated innovation across almost every part of our lives. You think of telehealth services where you don't need to see a doctor. You can do that online and have your prescription medication delivered to your home with contactless payments and an e-signature. We've seen our e-signatures business absolutely boom. So this everything as a service paradigm that we now find ourselves living in as a result of this technological acceleration of innovation has the means to marginalize us, to keep us more distant from each other and to put us in you know, that dark corner of being a business of one or a family of one. And we lose all of that connectedness, all of that social tissue that as social beings is so critically important to our success and our well-being. Simon, Grace, Michael, thank you very much for sharing your time with me on this important topic today. It's been a pleasure.